Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you? Thank you okay. for uh, meeting with me. Sure. How are you today? Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, again, uh, thank you for your time. Um, mm -hmm. this, this class is a bit of a struggle for, for mm -hmm. all of us. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> so we, not just me, but other students, we all we right. all appreciate you for helping us. Um, I'm in the library in a room, so I can tell. We're by ourselves <laughs> mm -hmm. at all times. Um, I was I wanted to meet with you today to see if we can possibly just do a quick recap on Anovas, um, mm -hmm. and just for a little bit, and then uh, go a bit into if we can go a bit into chapter thirteen about chi yes. squared, and right? <laughs> Um, okay. And then I, I don't think we'll have time to go into linear regression. Maybe that. No, on. no the chi square chapter is pretty long. Yeah. Plus, I, I have to stop at nine o'clock also. Right, right. That, that That's All okay. Right. Um, I, I didn't want to take up, you know, your time too much. I right. was going to ask you what, what time you wanted to <clears throat> get off. But right. as you mentioned, nine, that's, that's perfect. Uh, I think maybe that's something for next week. Um, mm -hmm. Linear oh, regression. definitely. Yeah, because um, the chi-square, how far have we gotten into the chi-square? Well, we, we didn't really talk about the chi-square last time, um, at least not when I was there. Mm -hmm. So, but our class finished the chi-square entirely. Oh, um, my God. I, yeah, I like within two days, so, uh, two days. So pretty much two days. So two very fast. Oh. Um I know so I know some of it. I if you reference things to me, I'll understand, but I just don't under, really understand the general structure and, and you know what the purpose is. <laughs> I see. For chi square. Well, um, the thing about chi square is that I mean chi square itself is just a probability distribution, but it's just that <clears throat> it, it can be used for a lot of different applications. All of the ones in this book would be uh involving different tests of hypotheses, but um you know they're they're pretty different from each other so, and and you know like up to this point we've been focusing on means and proportions but with chi square you can expand into other areas like for example um you can suddenly test the hypothesis about a population's variance which we couldn't do before and um you can test about whether or not two populations are independent of each other and whether or not um a population follows a specific probability distribution like the normal so each time, um, what's different about each one is the test statistic, the way it's constructed. And um, that's really where all the time goes in those tests is the test statistic. And I don't know if your class is using the calculators for that or not, because there's a lot of nice shortcuts in here for the chi-square distribution. <laughs> um, he hasn't taught us anything regarding calculators. Um, he did on Excel, but we'll never do the Excel on the exam, which I don't understand the purpose of. Um, unfortunately, yeah. I don't have my calculator with me today, but uh, I will write down the steps. The steps. So okay. I, can, I can go try them out later after I finish right. this call with you. Um, I, I rushed from what I was doing before to, to yeah. here. To <laughs> and you forgot it. Okay. Well, that's all right. Yeah, you're right. You can just write it all down. I actually um, have here this really nice um, tablet. I wish I could show you a picture of it because it's so good. <laughs> um it's um it's a wacom it's like this big it's really meant for people who are professional graphic designers but um it's it's great for writing notes that's for sure so uh whatever i put on here i can send it, you a copy of it so that way you won't lose the details if if we're you know if we're going to cover um the calculator steps and all that kind of thing Perfect. so um but actually one of the three I, I, and again, your your class might be different than mine. We went over the testing hypotheses about the variance, goodness of fit, and tests of independence. And so um, you probably did the same three. Yes, I think so. So, we, but I mean, we did interval estimation as well. Oh, okay. Our our class doesn't do that, but we can get that out of the book if you want it. Um, yeah, that's very good. True. I mean, you can't you can't cover everything with this book. There's so much material in there, so we have to make choices along the way and. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm going to go open up the book then in case we get to that point.
Yep. Um, probably not, but it, it, I know it's here. I have a PDF version of it right here. So we can do that if if necessary. No problem. But um, anyway, so probably if you want to start, maybe we should quickly review testing uh, hypotheses about a population variance because it's very straightforward. Um, for chi squared or for ANOVA? Yes. For, or, well, uh, okay. Well, do you want to do ANOVA first? Well, I just wanted to do a quick run through of it. Um, all right. I, I know the MSC and all that, all that, all that good stuff. But um, all right, let's do that then, and then we'll get back to chi square. All right, Thank so first you. thing I have to do is share my screen so you can actually see what I'm doing. And it's great that you're uh, also recording this so I can actually go, go back and watch it. <laughs> yeah, if you want a copy of it, um, I can send you the link. Um, I'm going to write this down somewhere. Uh, it's going to automatically, the thing is, the system I'm using, the, the Fordham system, I've chosen the default of recording the session in case people want to watch it again. And in order for you to watch it, um, actually, yeah, I was just thinking, probably the easiest thing to do, and this is what I used to do in the COVID when I had to be online, um, it, the files are pretty big. And so rather than try to send it to you, because it might not go through email as, as large as it is, what I would typically do is um, just put it in my YouTube account. And, um, oh, you know what I just realized? I've, they've got this really strange new thing on Google where you, you've got like different, um, uh, like you, you could be in a different, um, I don't know what, it's like little separate, I'm not even sure what they call them. Yeah, accounts um, that you can use, you can click whatever it way. is. Yeah, it's very frustrating because I don't know what the <clears> hell they're, they're doing. Um, and if you're in one, you you can't get stuff in the other one. But anyway, so this is my um, YouTube account, and if you go in there, yeah, so you can just send me a link to the uh, to the YouTube video after you. That's right. Uh, that's what it was. Yes, that's what I'll do. So in other words, you can see. Um, I have all these. That'll be perfect. There's so that in that case, uh, that'll save you some time too. So I can just send this video to someone else if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's send fine. it to us. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, what am I going to do? Sell it? I mean, really? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll make a note to myself because I haven't had to do this for a while. Uh, I, be, I mean, usually when I tutor, tutoring is different. People don't always necessarily want to watch the video, but when it was an actual class, like during the, the COVID, um, then I made sure everyone got a copy of it. So I'm going to remind myself to send you a link. And so that way, all it's doing is sending you back to my email, uh, YouTube account. That's all. You can see, oh, I've got tons of this stuff here. Oh, my God. I've accumulated so many over the years. Um, <laughs> I'll put it, I'll try to make um, a, a, what is that called? Playlist for, I, I'll put your name on it, let's say. So you can find it more easily. Perfect. Well, the link will take me directly to that to that playlist or or video, so it, it'll be it'll be good. That's right. Okay. Okay. So anyway, let's get back to uh, Anova. So I've got the notes open here now. In our class, I decided just to do the one way Anova because the two way is so horribly time consuming. And we've only got so much time. So I figured, well, you know, let's just do the one way. I don't know if your class is doing one and two way. But um, anyway, so here we go. So we're, we're trying to test hypotheses about two or more population units. Although you usually see this done with three because two you could just do directly with the uh, T test. So it's three where this really starts to become useful because um, suddenly you can now test hypotheses about as many means as you want. And so uh, what separates one way from two ways, how many different factors are being uh, tested? In other words, like if I want to know if, um, like with our case with the batteries, if their lives are equal to each other, um, that's one way because I'm only testing one thing and that's the very lifetime. If I'm also mm -hmm. trying to test out um, the lifetime and then the manufacturers, that's a different matter. That requires two-way ANOVA because you're testing two things at once. You're trying to attribute the differences in the means to the different manufacturers 
and it really does get very messy, very hurry, but uh, uh, in a big hurry. So I, I think I did show you how to use the calculator for ANOVA, didn't I? Yes, I, I know how to do the, uh, we, we, we do the lists. We create the lists, we right. enter it in the list, and then we do the ANOVA. Um, that's, I know how to do the calculator function on that one. Okay, okay. good, good, good. All right. So yeah, this is one of the examples we did. Um, <clears throat> three new batteries. We're trying to compare um, three new batteries to see if their lifetimes are equal. So the battery lifetime is the dependent variable. So we're assuming that there's some independent and some dependent variable. Here, the dependent variable is the lifetime. The independent variable is the battery type. And that's what we mean by the factors. Or treatments, actually, um, with one way over the treatments and the factors are the same thing. So in other words, I've got three or four columns showing different um, types of batteries. And then in each column, I've got the means or the number of hours from each one. So I'm trying to find out if the means are equal to each or not. Okay, it's pretty much, it's a yes or no type of situation typically. Um, like all of them are the same or they're not all the same. Right, for the hypothesis testing. Yes, Okay. that's correct. The null would be something like um, the means are all three means are equal. Uh, the alternative would be that they're not which could mean a lot of things. It could mean the first one is different from the others, the second one, the third one, the first and the third. You know, it's a lot of possibilities. But usually we're trying to find out right off the bat, are they all the same or not? If they're not, that means one of them has to be the highest of the three. And we want to, we may want to identify that one and just focus uh, on manufacturing that one. If they're all the same, you know, we may not care which one we make. But, um, for some reason, it matters if they're all the same or not. Okay, so now here's the table of data. Now, the top, these are the um, the treatments. The factor would be considered the battery type. Um, the treatments are the individual battery types, which we're just calling one, two, and three here. And then we have samples. Um, there's four of each. And we want to know if the means are equal. So. What we have to do is a lot of calculations based on this table. And the notation that we'll use is um, where for each of these subscripts, the first one is the row and the second one is the column. So you can see, for example, this one is 3, 2, because it is the third row and the second column. Okay, so that's standard matrix notation anyway. <laughs> so we need to know, first things first, what is the mean of each column? Right, because um, that's going to give us some useful insights into whether or not the means are equal. Now, you can see they're not equal. The question is whether or not the differences are enough to justify rejecting the null hypothesis. If that's all there was to it, this would be a breeze. Okay, now in spite of the scary notation, all you're doing is adding these up and dividing by the sample or the number in that column. So the first one is 9.2 or 2.4. 7.4 over 4, and finally 8.6 over 4. And by the way, these columns don't have to have the same number of observations. Um, in fact, some of the examples we did on the board the other day, um, some of them did not. So it's very flexible in that sense. Anyway, now another thing we need to look at, we have to calculate this overall or grand mean. And we need to know not just the average within each column, but how all of these are related to the overall mean. Because you want to know how different are these means from each other. And so the way to do that is compare them all to the uh, X, X bar bar or X double bar, which is uh, our grand or overall mean. So we're going to take, um, first, this is how it's calculated. You're literally just adding up all the elements in the entire table and dividing by 12. It's that simple. So here we go. Now we've got all these different sums of squares to think about. The treatment sum of squares, given that the columns are treatments, that means that the treatment sums of squares is derived by taking um, the average of each column or treatment minus the overall mean squared. And then what we have to do is for NJ, we have the number of elements or the number actually the number of treatments because if you notice the index is j it runs from one to t so the number of treatments is multiplied by this number to come up with the sum of the treatment 
some some of the square treatments is what it's called. And that's that's used for finding out the relationship in between these. Uh, between that's right. It's often referred to as the between sum of squares in some books. The column differences are often called the within sum of squares, and that's this book calls it the error sum of squares. In other words, we're trying to find out how much different these elements are within the same column from the column mean. So like from here to here, how different are these from the 2.3? How different are these from the 1.85? And how different are these um, from 2.15? So what they're really looking for is evidence that the differences between the columns are significantly different than the uh, variation within each column. There's, there's a graph in the book. It's kind of helpful. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's just stick with this. But so this for this one, see what we have to do um, for the first column. We're basically running through the entire column and comparing each element with the mean of that column only. Okay. And then we do the same thing for column two and for column three, and then we add them up. And so this is the within sum of squares. The other one, the, the treatment sum of squares is the between sum of squares. So the F statistic that we're using to test our, the, our hypothesis is the ratio of the average treatment sum of squares over the average uh, error sum of squares, or in other words, sub. Essentially, you're thinking about the average between sum of squares versus the average uh, within sum of squares. So basically the logic is that the variance is very different between the, the columns, then it's not likely that the means are equal. So the and now the F statistic is required because we're taking the ratio of these two sums of squares. And so that here you can see it gave us a test statistic of 1.24, which is quite small. And that's because you can see by looking at the data, I mean, realistically, the variances look pretty similar to each other. These are all fairly close. Then you know, there's the whole range of possible values. Here's 1.3. This one, it's, well, it's a little smaller than that, but there's, there's not that much difference between them. So anyway, this is the test statistic. The critical values come from Obviously, the F distribution, there's actually only one, okay, F, because when, the way F is constructed, we can only look into the right tail for our critical values. And these are the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. And the way we construct them is just by um, calculating the appropriate degrees of freedom the numerator refers to the uh, uh, treatments because of the way the numerator is constructed. Remember, there's only three columns here. We're comparing them to each other. And so there's only two degrees of freedom, T minus one. Whereas the denominator, we're going through every single element and comparing it to the overall mean. That means we're going to have uh, altogether N minus T degrees of freedom. The thing is about degrees of freedom is that what you're trying to capture is how many unique values are there in your observations? So if we only have three columns, the treatment, the, the uh, degrees of freedom or the mean treatment sums of squares is going to be one less than three because we're only really doing three calculations. Let's, see, let's go back and review that real fast. There's, where is that? There it is. The error sum of squares 
um, you're, you're actually getting every element involved. And so therefore the degrees of freedom is much larger. 12 for the entire data set minus the three column means and you end up with nine degrees of freedom. So you look this up in the table. So you end up with uh, the degrees of freedom are two for the numerator, nine for the denominator. And we're assuming alpha is 0.05. As, and as you know, the table only shows uh, one tail area of 0.05. If you want something else, you need a different table. This is one thing that, by the way, is not in these calculators. Um, hold on. Oh, here it is. Yeah, if you look in here, you're not going to find this test statistic. But I mean, you don't really need it because you can find the p-value in here, but this one has to come from a table. And the key with this is that the numerator is always in the top, the denominator is over here in the first column, and there at their intersection here, we have 4.26, and that is our um, critical value. So that means that right there, you could see um, the rejection region would be anything above 4.26, but we ended up with a test statistic of 1.24. So therefore, we do not reject the null that the means are equal. So even though they're not identical to each other, for all practical purposes, the differences in means are not large enough um, to conclude that they're different. So yeah, now this is the official from the book way of calculating these numbers. And you can see it's pretty terrifying looking. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> once you do it, by hand, you'll say, oh, you know, that's not so bad. Because you, you start to realize what exactly are we doing? Oh, um, well, you know, we know what we're doing just by looking at the steps we took. And um, that's going to lead us to our results. Now, the calculator itself, if you want to get all this done directly with the calculator, you do need to put the three columns into your lists. And then it's easy because you just go to the stat tests, H and OVA, type in the three lists that you put your data in, and then it, it basically gives you everything you want. You've got the you statistic, you've got the p-value. Um, these are the treatment. By the way, here they are calling a factor. We're calling a treatment. Treatment sums of squares. It means the same thing. Um, this is the uh, within. I'm uh, sorry, between. This is within the error. And then, so we end up with all these different sums of squares. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this is, but they put it in there. I think they that's only there if you're doing two-way and over. But anyway, um, all of this um, is used to put together the F statistic. Well, they, they've done that for us. They've also kindly showed us the p-value. And so if you have the p-value, you might as well just use that and compare it to your alpha to see if you should reject the null or not. There's, of course, as you know, if the p-value is greater than alpha, you do not reject. And so, again, that means that uh, we cannot reject the null, that all three battery mean lifetimes are equal. So, anyway, that was all one way to know. Now, and since we didn't do anything else, I don't have any more notes for this. But if you need them, they're in the book, which um, this is the book. And, oh, that's the wrong chapter. It does have a couple of other applications. For example, um, I don't know if you've done this in your class, the so-called randomized block experiment design. Yes, we did. Where there's some pattern to the way the data are organized, where you're trying to find out essentially two things at once, um, not just that the means are different between the columns, but if there's some impact on the, um, the rows on on the um on the means so like here if they're trying to test something here about distances and whether a sign can be read or not and so um what they're trying to do is make sure that the first row is all yeses m is oh these wait a minute oh these are ages Huh. So they're trying to find out if these traffic signs can be read at night. I guess they, they come up with some visibility measure. And so we got the four signs, but then we also have three age groups. So this is done on purpose because normally it's just a random jumble of uh, data. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just, it's organized by treatment, 
but the rows are not in any particular sequence. So here they've, they've actually added that extra factor. And um, just to find out if um, they're not only equal to each other, but equal within each of these age groups. So there's an extra factor in there, the block factor. And uh, let's see, look, oh my God, look at how much messier it gets. Because there's an extra round of sums of squares in here that you have to take into account, the block sums of squares. And so you've got, oh my God. Um, but th that would be just to find out if there's any uh, effect of the uh, blocks on our results. The the ultimate, I mean, the goal to find out if the means are equal to each other still is the same. But um, yeah, so we we did do the uh, the blocking sums of okay. squares in our class. Okay. Um, um. Wow. Well, what well, what what's the main difference between between these? I mean. Oh yeah, like imagine if um with my battery example. I made sure. Or how about this? I'm the I'm the manufacturer of these batteries, but I have several factories scattered around the country. So if within my table, let's just say that I didn't just have a random selection of batteries of each type. God, where, oh, here it is. So here it says battery one. What if instead it said factory one or something like that? Factory two. So what are you I'm adding saying, another variable in there? Yes, exactly. So that way um, I can find out two things at once. Are the battery means equal or and are the means at each factory equal to each other? So it may be that for some factories, the means are equal and in other factories, they're not. And I want to know that because maybe um, that tells me that something's not right with the manufacturing process. So there's that extra piece of information that I can take out of this if I organize the data according to rows as well as columns. Now, as far as this calculator goes, I don't think it is able to do that, um, the blocking stuff. I think you can only do this simple one-way ANOVA process. But from what I understand, Excel can do um all of all three of them in other words yeah, locking yeah, we did that in excel but i don't know how i don't i am not sure if he's going to test us on it uh he probably will knowing knowing it's him um yeah but, so so there's you know, only I, basically just one extra step in there right yes that's right the data has to be organized properly it means there's an extra round an extra set of uh, sums of squares that you need to take into account mm -hmm. too but um, it also means you have two things that you can test simultaneously. If you notice, like here, when we're looking at the chart, it had two different F statistics. Those are used to test two different hypotheses. Or the, in my example, the battery means equal and or the factories means equal to each other. If that information is important. If it's not, then you would just have a random jumble of um, battery type one, two, three, and four, regardless of what factory it comes from. Okay, so um, like I said, you know, I decided that we didn't have time for this, so I, it's not in here in these notes, which, um, by the way, that reminds me, um, if you want to copy these slides, I can send them to you. Uh, that'll, that'll be great, yeah. Um, if you because as you can see, I write them myself. I know every textbook has its own uh, slides that you can use that come with the book, but um, I find them that, I don't know, I'd just rather do it myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it's I can explain it a little more straightforwardly. And also I can make up my own examples, which, you know, the uh, the slides with the book, I'm sure they're fine, but um, you don't have a whole lot of flexibility. Well, the students love the way you do that. So um, good. I, so I, um, I get a lot of feedback, maybe more feedback than you actually than you get <laughs> from the reviews. Yeah, I don't really know. You know, the thing is I really don't know get a whole lot of feedback. I just hope that everything's okay. Unless somebody says, oh, I'm really stuck or I can't do this. Um, I figure everything's okay. And that's the last I hear about it. Yeah, no, students love it when, uh, love your slides. I mean, they're a Good. big, 
they're a big thing that um they're they're almost called a, a hack uh for for our class that that's what that's right. what they're considered in our class <laughs> wow yeah um okay that's good um <laughs> people ask us between the ex uh, before the exam did you get dr anderson's uh cheat sheet and they're referring to the slides <laughs> yeah yeah um well okay that's pretty cool um so yeah hopefully that made your day a little bit better uh, <laughs> it did you know i feel like you know the whole point is to make them uh, helpful and if they are helpful people wouldn't say things like that unless they were helpful so that's good to people know. do go out of their way to say it um so yeah, <laughs> it's, it's nice i think i think we can move on to the yeah high let's school. go on to high school you um, know what i um block I really design don't think i don't think onova is Quite as helpful in finance and economics as, as chi square is it's really, oh, really meant for disciplines where you can carry out experiments um like in biology agriculture psychology it's not quite as useful and for our purposes i don't think chi square has a lot of interesting things that uh, it can do um so let's go grab some chi square slides so we'll start with a quick um uh, look at the uh, testing of hypotheses about the population variance. And um, I'm sure you went over the properties of the chi-square distribution. It looks like this. I mean, it basically, um, you can see that it's it's like the F in the sense that it's skewed to the right, it has no negatives, but it only has one degree of freedom. And um, as you keep increasing that degree of freedom, it does start to look more and more like the normal distribution. And also here, the numbers are quite large. So in other words, your test statistic and critical values can be quite quite large numbers. Um, in fact, they can go up over 100 in some cases. So it's not, you know, it takes a little getting used to. But um, anyway, so when we're testing hypotheses about the variance, it isn't really much different than what we've done with the mean. Here you're comparing the variance with some spec assumed uh, value. Um, that little zero means this is the hypothesized value. And then we have the right, left, and two-tailed tests that we've seen all along. Um, and they're pretty self-explanatory. This first one is the two-tailed test, the right and the left-tailed test. You can tell by the direction of the uh, arrows that greater than or less than signs. And then unequal is refer um, refers to the two-tailed test. Now, here for the first time, we have a very straightforward test statistic. Um, we haven't had any simple ones in a while. And so you can see these are just things we've seen before. N is the sample size. S is the um, standard deviation. Therefore, S squared is the sample variance. This is our hypothesized variance down here. So it's a very straightforward. What's not so straightforward is finding critical values under the chi-square distribution. And that's partially because the table is actually oriented towards the right tail rather than the left tail. Let me go get it for you. This is the table that comes with the book. And it does say in the graph that this is, these are right tail areas. But um, so what that means is that, let me draw a few pictures here. Let's say you've got um, uh, alpha is 0.05. Let's say that the um, sample size is 10. Now, for this type of test, um, the degrees of freedom is actually just n minus 1, which is 9. So if you've got a right tail test, how do we look up the critical value? Well, we, that means we want 5% in the right tail. Whatever this number is, we can write it as chi square. And down here, you have to have two denominators or two numbers in the um, subscript because the new the, we're already using up a two up here. So um, make that a little neater. In other words, the way the chi square is written. Unlike the T, where we had, remember the superscript is the degrees of freedom and the subscript was the alpha or the tail area? Yes. <clears throat> well, here we can't do that because there's already a two up there in the superscript. So we'll put both the alpha and the degrees of freedom down here. 
That's a rejection region. So here we have chi square. 5% is in the right tail. And we have nine degrees of freedom. And if we go to the table, that would put us, this is, the, oh, I forgot, this is PDF. Um, PDF is kind of a pain in the butt in my head. But, um, <laughs> it's, it's up here. Oh, maybe I can just highlight it. And then nine degrees of freedom, that would put us right 16 yes. point. All right, I, it doesn't really work that well, but um, okay. so we'll go back here and this is 16. Anything above that means we reject the null. Uh, and since this is a right tail test, this means that testing whether or not whether um, or not the variance is greater than that constant we specified. Well, the, the null hypothesis is, it, is the actual variance equals to the hypothesized variance. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, the way that's written, so every book is a little different. Um, that implicitly means, even in spite of the way it's written, what this really means is that whatever's not in the alternative hypothesis is included in the null. Okay, I, I just find it easier to write it as equals every time. Um, some folks would actually do something like this to remind you that it includes everything that's not in the alternative because the two of them, um, they both have to account for every possibility. In other words, one or the other has to be true at all times. There's nothing, there isn't anything else that could be true. So think of them as uh, essentially, I guess, complements of each other. And then, of course, the left tail test. Mean. Um, I have to be a little careful with this thing because um, it, it's kind of weird. If if I try to draw some place after the cursor, it, it can get broken up and split up. And um, so I have to keep my eye on that. But anyway, the left tail test, this is where it's going to get interesting compared to what you're used to seeing with the normal and the T distribution, where we just have a negative of the right tail critical value. Here we can't have that because there's no negatives. So what do we do about it? Well, the way we express it is this. So then we're looking at here, but the thing is now if alpha is 0.05 and it's 10, so the degrees of freedom is nine. That means the left tail area is 5%, but the, because the table is geared towards the right tail, that means when I look it up in the table, I'm actually gonna ask if the right 95% of the distribution and so not the left 5%, but the right five, 95%. So when we look at that up in the table, I'm going over to this column. That's going so to be if, it's, if it's a right tailed, then the area, the, I, I guess the way to remember it is this, if it's right tailed, then it's the area is a little small. It's very small. That's right. Yes. So a left tailed, then the area is huge. So we have to kind of, include that whole entire area. So it's going to be a, a big number. So that the, the opposite number of the of alpha. Right. Right. So if this had been like the normal or the T, um the left the critical value for the left tail test is just the negative of what we have for the right tail test. But here we don't have that. So but what we do have is the idea that the left tail is five percent. That still hasn't changed. But to look up the values you need, you have to think about that as not left 5% tail, but the right 95% tail. 
So it's a little, it takes a little getting used to, but you can see it's the same idea. It was up here, it was the other way around. And this will be written more formally as chi square one minus alpha df. When you see that in the slides, that's what it refers to. It looks very mysterious, but that's all it means. It's just a reminder that you have to look in the right tail for your probability or your test statistic, or, sorry, critical values. What am I saying? All right, now, whoops. Uh, I see what you're talking about with the cursor now. <laughs> yeah, I have to keep my eyes open on that because it, there's something about these tablets. Um, you you got to be careful with the spacing. The cursor is here, so I can write up here. But if I try to write down here, um, then it'll keep following the cursor. Unless maybe I'm not using it right. Um, okay. But anyway, then what about the two-tailed test? So we're going to assume 0.05 per alpha, and it's 10 degrees of freedom is n minus 1, which is 9. Therefore, what we're looking for is we need two critical values. This one has 2.5% in the left tail, which means 97.5% in the right tail. Actually, I'm going to just write that as 9 so you can see. But... um. This would have been written as 1 minus alpha over 2. This would have been written as alpha over 2 when we look these up, uh, or they're listed in the in this, uh, slides. So we can look these up in the table. So for the 9 degrees of freedom, 0.975 is here at 2.7. one is um, 19.023. So if the test statistic is not in either of those uh, halves of the rejection region, then we will not reject the null. We can only reject it in this case if the test statistic is less than 2.7 or more than 19.023. So that, that part is, takes a little getting used to. But then in this one, um, at least, you can see the test statistic is very easy to calculate. Um, so then, of course, we compare the test statistic with the critical value, or else we look at the p-values. But this calculator doesn't have this built into it. This one you have to do manually, the old-fashioned way. So in fact, I'm not even sure if this calculator can come up with a p-value, the chi-square. So instead, we're going to use the traditional approach of test statistic um, critical value. So anyway, I've got this example in my slides here where we take an investor who uh, has 30, well, it has a big portfolio and they take 30 of those stocks and they calculate the standard deviations of the returns. Now, that the standard deviation is actually a standard measure of risk in the uh, stock markets, which we call volatility. Then this investor um, is trying to find out if um, the vo volatility or standard deviation of the entire portfolio is less than 0.25 or 25%. Because if so, um, he may want to change the composition of the portfolio. Maybe he thinks that's too conservative, let's say. Okay. So, um, you know, some investors are, are more um, worried about risk than others. Sure. What happened now? I think this entire graph has to be moved. And sometimes it goes willingly and sometimes it doesn't. You see what I mean? So it's kind of a pain. There we go. Yeah.
we love dealing with technology sometimes. Yeah, no, but it can be such a headache too. Yeah, it it, it gives us a lot, um, but it can really be a pain in the butt too. <laughs> but um, all right. So what's happening here with this example is you've got um oh by the way, because we're technically looking for uh, a hypothesis about the variance, what we're gonna do is write it like this. Um instead of writing it as 0.25 for the standard deviation. We're going to square that and write it as 0.0625 for the variance. So even though technically it means the same thing, um, if you were to let's fix that, write it like this, you would not be wrong. It's just that you know technically we're trying to find test hypotheses about the variance. So what I've done is I've rewritten it as sigma squared. If you square this, you'll get 0 0.0625. So our no is that the variance is 0 0.0625 among these stocks. And um, the um, alternative is that it's less than 0 0.0625. Now we chose that as a left tail test because if it turns out that this is the case, then the investor will make a change. And so, but you won't want to do that unless it's absolutely necessary. So it's a very conservative approach. The alternative is really showing you what would trigger a, a change of some kind or an action of some kind, or maybe what it is you're actually looking for. Okay. So, because if we do reject the null, that means we have very strong evidence that the null was not true. So anyway, um, then, All right, here we go. So here's what you're doing. We, we know that the sample. Um, oh, what did you say? I said uh, this will be a left tail test. Uh, for this it will be a left tail test. Because we're looking for evidence that the um, the variance is below a certain level. All right, now we're ready. So the sample turned out to be a st sample standard deviation was point twenty three. Also have a sample size of 30. We chose 30 stocks to do this test. So we're going to assume is it so often the case that the alpha is 0.05. That's a pretty common choice. So then we want to go over the test or calculate the test statistic. We're going to have 30 minus 1, 0.23 squared. So we don't have to square, it's already written as 0 0.00625. Oh, not double O, just zero. So if you take out your calculator and calculate this number, it's going to be something like 20. I only know this because I did it just before. Um, like not like you can do this in my head or something. Um, although you do meet people like that. <laughs> I'm sure you've met many through your career. <laughs> yeah. There's actually an entire movie made about um, a, a, a very famous mathematician from the early 20th century who like had this insane skill. You could do almost anything in his head mathematically. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But anyway, there's our test statistic. Now the critical value, but he he would push it to an extreme. Like um, everything he saw in life had something to do with math, and people would almost test him on it. Like um, I remember this one 
there was an incident where I can't remember the exact number. I think it was 1721. It was this friend of his comes to his hotel in London and says, oh, I'm sorry. I got off and I was in ta cab 1721. Not a very interesting number. Sorry about that. And, and he said, um, oh, but don't you see it's the, was it, it was the smallest, no, the only number that can be expressed as the sum of three cubes in two different ways or something like that. This is the what kind of the thing. Heck? Think what? About. Yeah. You know, this is what his life is all about. Yes. Um, so any number you throw to him, he's going to have some <clears throat> interesting thing to talk about. But um, I guess that's how you get to be a famous mathematician. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I could look it up later on. Um, I, I just I'm starting to get the details, um, but they made a movie out of this guy's life, and it was quite interesting. <laughs> some, <laughs> would say it's very interesting. some would say it's very boring because he deals with numbers every day. <laughs> no, it was actually um, it was really quite interesting because um, this is incredible genius. And yet people were really um, let's just say they didn't react well to him. He, they, I guess he was too much a. Uh, didn't realize that he was very uh, off-putting and uh, people were concerned and they, you know, they kind of avoided him and all this and that. And, uh, but anyway, see, see. Um, so now the critical values. There's only one. This is a left tail test. Remember how this works. Um, one minus alpha. Since alpha is 0.1, and since we have 30 in our, in our sample size, alpha is 0.05, when my alpha is 0.95. So we need to find the value where we have. 0.95 in the right tail. If 0.05 is in the left tail, 95 is in the right tail, and then 29 degrees of freedom. If we go to the table, and we're going to look for the 17.708. So anything less than that is going to cause us to reject the null. But the test statistic was 24.55. So therefore, we do not reject the null. The variance is 0 0.0625. And that means that the investor does not have to make any changes. Since there is not enough evidence to show that the variance is less than 0 0.0625. In other words, there is not enough evidence to show that um, the standard deviation is less than 0 0.25, which is what he was really concerned about. He's not he's that the there's not that much volatility for him to make make a change. Right. In other words, he's he's basically he's in the zone that he wants to be in, given the amount of risk that he's willing to take on. Um you would think that you know people would say <clears throat> less risk is better, but the reason why that's not the case is because in the financial markets, for the most part, the riskiest stocks are the ones that have the highest average rates of return. So right. if you're like trying to be fairly aggressive with your investments. You don't want stocks that are too safe because then you'll never get your uh, your higher rate of return. Especially if you're like a day trader or something, you want the volatility to be to be high. Yeah, so, to so that way, return. when as soon as your stock goes up a certain level, you just get out of it. Right. Yeah, day trading, you Absolutely. know, a lot. That used to be a big thing. Um, 
there's a lot of companies trying to promote software for people to be day traders. And then I guess when it turned out that that wasn't such an easy thing to do, um, that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah, there used to be ads on TV all the time, like, oh my God, just day trade and you'll be rich and all this and that. It's definitely not because it's just, it's just no. like gambling if you don't know what you're doing because you're actually playing with yeah. real money. Yeah. See, um, the problem is that the, even if you're doing well, you, all the transaction costs could suck up all of your profits. And um, yeah. just one or two bad trades and you're really in trouble. So, um, you know, it, it's just not that simple. And, um, you know, for, usually investments is the kind of thing you should think of as a long-term activity. Um, you're looking years and years and years and even decades, not like did the price go up five minutes ago and maybe I better sell the stock. So anyway, this is a classic example of a test of um, the variance. And so what's going to happen is the next thing is the goodness of fit, which is messier, because what you actually have to do is calculate probabilities from, let's say, the Poisson or the normal distribution, and then compare them to the ones you actually have in your in your sample, and then um, run the test. So it's, but, but once we get to that point, I can show you how to speed it up a bit by putting your results in this calculator, and it will take care of that uh, test statistic which is actually quite messy so we're getting into this the last couple of topics in this chapter um the calculator can give us a lot of help okay right for this one not so much it doesn't have really anything that we need but that will change very quickly <laughs> so anyway but at least now we know how to do this right um so on my schedule, uh, my exam for for stats is uh, next Monday, the 13th. Oh, oh, my God, yeah. that's pretty close. Yeah, very fast. He's trying to get it out of the way before Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, but there's like two plus weeks until Thanksgiving. I mean, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm, I'm, you know, willing to let it go to like the 17th, let's say. Um, even then, I would do the, the 20th if people were willing to do it, but they don't seem to be. I asked them all, like, do you want to do it on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving? And it was like, no, 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 no. Um, so that means it has to be that Friday before. Well, our exam was supposed to be the 6th, and he moved it to the 13th. Oh, wow. We were like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> come on. Wow. Well, by the way, what is it going to do after 13? What's coming next in your class? Is it regression? Linear regression. That's what we, that's what we kind of, I don't want to say finished, but we're, we're almost there. <laughs> yeah. Regression is a very complex topic. I mean, you could spend weeks and weeks and months. You could have the whole course could just be regression. That's how uh, involved it is. Oh, but um, luckily, this one, you can get some help out of your calculator. It's not just Excel, although obviously Excel is, is a great tool, but for using it on a test, um, this does have at least simple regression built into it, where you can, as long as there's only one independent variable, you can get the results you need out of the calculator and all the other um, numerical values that you use to test the results. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you put all your data in the list, um, you can get the numbers you need, but it's a very complicated topic, and um, there's a lot of details. <laughs> so that's why that ends up being the topic on the final exam because it's kind of involved. My class, we're just going to do that one chapter, and that's it for the final, just because it's it's that <clears throat> intense. Wow. Yeah. What does that tell you? Yeah. It's 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 a complex topic, 100%. Um I think the ne is is the next time we will be able to meet maybe next Sunday. Yes, that would be the 12th the day before your test. <laughs> um I'm going to see if I can pull some strings and come maybe Wednesday. On Wednesday. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I'll be there whether you come or not. So you might as well. <laughs> um, although it, it doesn't look good on my on my attendance. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, no, sometimes I mean they got to understand you're a student, and you know this has to come first. Right. Um, so, I guess what's what's left on the table is the goodness of fit for Kaiser. Yes, and also uh, the good test of independence test of independence and so those two things and then phew, linear regression as well um right but at least that's not going to be on your next exam that's going to be on the final only right I, you, yeah uh, I, no. I, i'm not quite sure about that. no there's no way you could squeeze that in in time for your, your second midterm it's too much it's probably going to be the only topic on your final exam unless he wants to do a comprehensive exam but um, that's probably the last topic you'll have time to do. So, so, so luckily, let's suppose you're right. Uh, we only do ANOVA and then chi squared. Right. Um, uh, then, then we honestly look pretty good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, because that's. I mean, if, if he's going to give you a test a week from Monday, you can't do a completely new topic. That's kind of what he did last time. <laughs> oh, um, oh my God! Yeah, so that's wow. why this this class is is very um, it's it's quite challenging. Well, Not, it's this it's um, just, if there was some other simpler topic that he could throw at you, maybe, but not not regression. That's um, it's just too much. And uh, the good thing about regression though is that um, at least in economics, even though it's complicated, you're going to use it all the time. Almost all research in economics is ultimately based on regression analysis. I see. Okay. So, um, oops, I've got somebody else coming. I better go. <laughs> I understand. Um, thank you for your time. Um, all right. And I'll talk okay. to you uh, th throughout the week to check in okay. on you with your uh, schedule and everything. Right. So, okay. Thank you. All right. I'll see you then. All right. Thank you. Okay, I bye. Have a good evening.